The Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsek. This is part four of chapter one. Chapter one is called The Unconscious is Politics from Socio to Marx. Part four is called The Logic of Surplus and Loss. The gap between representation and production certainly reflects an inner break in the social link, but it also has a structuring function that amounts to the well-known result that drives capitalist social relations. It is in this gap that what is called surplus value is produced and falls. Non-identical to itself, the subject no longer enjoys. Something called surplus jouissance is lost. The double production of the subject of loss and the surplus object is accompanied by the appearance that the object originally belonged to the subject and was only lost at a later stage. This appearance is the negative correlate to the fetishization of capitalist abstractions and motivates a misinterpretation of the worker's position. The psychoanalytic supplement to the Marxist critique of fetishism is contained in the very homophony of plus in plus de jouir, which means both more jouissance and no more jouissance. The formulation resumes the central Freudian thesis that jouissance knows no right measure and that its production entirely undermines the homeostatic model on which, for instance, Aristotelian ethics as well as economic liberalism built their economic and political theories. Behind the subjective pursuit of egoistic private interest, the multiplicity of small human narcissisms from which, for Adam Smith and other liberal economists, somewhat miraculously grows a stable social relation, there's a structural loss, which in advance corrupts the capitalist pursuit of happiness and its fantastic success stories. In opposition to political economy, Freud grounded his metapsychological account of libidinal economy and the rejection of the homeostatic model. The homeostatic vision of the mental apparatus is definitively abolished in, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, where the notion of the death drive, the emblem of the constitutive instabilities of libidinal economy, enters the picture. The two aspects of fetishism are addressed in Lacan's formula of fantasy, according to which the fetishization varies depending on whether the given conditions are observed from the position of the subject or of the object. In the first case, the structurally generated appearance suggests that the subject and the object form two compatible halves that could be fused together in a non-problematic totality. In the second, the subject of valorization appears to be capital itself, as the fetishization of capitalist abstractions suggests. In any case, the subject's non-identity is perceived as secondary and as something that could be abolished simply by correcting the structural relations that brought the subject into existence. The standard social democratic scenario moves in this direction, including the workers in a more just distribution of profit, collective ownership of the means of production, regulating financial speculation, and bringing the economy down to the solid ground of the real sector. More radical political experiments were, were equally unsuccessful in, ab in abolishing alienation. It's not because one nationalizes the means of production at the level of socialism in one country that one has thereby done away with surplus value if one doesn't know what it is. Nationalization does not produce the necessary global structural change which would abolish the market of labor and thereby the structural contradiction that transforms the subject into a commodity producing commodity. The non-relation between labor power and surplus value remains operative. And nationalization in the last instance evolves into a form of state capitalism. Marx, however, did not claim that the appropriation of surplus value would abolish the capitalist forms of alienation and fetishization this would suggest that the abolition of capitalists, these social fanatics of the valorization of value and personifications of capital would already solve the problem. Marx's point is rather that capitalism can exist without capitalists because the capitalist drive to self-valorization self is structural.
systemic and autonomous, but there cannot be any capitalism without the proletariat. The critical and materialist signification of alienation departs from the autonomy of the signifier and leads to the conclusion that alienation is structure. No identity or jouissance precedes non-identity and loss, and consequently no subjective wholeness is abolished, and no immediate access to jouissance is made impossible by the intervention of the signifier. Such a position would indeed place psychoanalysis in a symmetrical understanding of alienation, which echoes in Freud's earlier accounts of the relation between sexuality and culture, and eventually in Freudo Marxism. Identity assumes the same status as the idealist notion of human essence that Marx criticized in his predecessors. The equivalence between alienation and structure, by contrast, leaves no doubt that the flip side of the production of surplus is the reproduction of lack, the true matter by which the subject is constituted. The equivocity of the, of the plus in surplus value and surplus jouissance allows Lacan to conclude that the discursive structure of capitalism imposes the renunciation of jouissance rather than its prohibition. This renunciation is what makes of the capitalist a modern master. The point is not necessarily self-evident, notably if we recall the conclusion of Marx's critique of primitive accumulation, the founding myth of political economy, according to which the capitalist historically accumulated the first wealth through saving, while the proletarian enjoyed beyond his limits until he was left solely with his labor power. In this process, his entire existence was reduced to a labor without qualities which stained his being with having. Marx mobilizes this main feature of alienation to his own advantage under the abolition of the political economic myth of primitive accumulation. In the capitalist universe, commodity is not simply yet another private property, but the privileged form of being. The ontological question of being is thus necessarily preceded and conditioned by the pre-ontological question of having, whereby the asymmetry between the subjective lack and objective surplus highlights the modern coordinates of the ontological problematic. This effort implicitly traverses Marx's critique of materialism in his theses on Feuerbach and determines its future orientation. There is no critique of political economy without an implicit materialist ontology. But let us return here to the link between labor and the renunciation of jouissance. According to Lacan, this is not the actual novelty of Marx and Freud's concept of labor. Their critical contribution is in explaining this renunciation as something that is structurally imposed on the subject by the relations of domination. From the very start, contrary to what Hegel claims or seems to claim, it is precisely this renunciation that constitutes the master, who knows very well how to make it the principle of his power. What is new here is that there is a discourse that articulates this renunciation and makes it appear within something that it will call the function of surplus jouissance. The correction of the political economic idea of renunciation becomes more evident here. The master does not renounce some substantial jouissance, but instead structurally imposes the renunciation on every subject. The equivocity of plus and surplus jouissance again turns out to be crucial. Surplus jouissance, surplus jouissance is not some jouissance that would reach beyond another jouissance, in the sense that there would be a certain quantity of jouissance to which something more is added. The actual correlate to the surplus jouissance produced by the same discursive cut is the lack of jouissance. The renunciation of jouissance therefore contains more than the battle for pure prestige through which Hegel seems to approach the master-slave dialectic. The capitalist relations of domination build on this double face of the surplus. Production goes hand in hand with renunciation, the more with the no more. The double structural imperative, production of surplus and production of lack through renunciation, initiates a negative spiral in which no produced surplus is surplus enough. The capitalist master constantly demands more, the famous encore that Lacan placed in the title of one of his seminars. Marx in his turn exemplified this imperative in the so-called abstinence theory of the capitalist.
but insofar as he is capital personified, his motivating force is not the acquisition of enjoyment of use values, but the acquisition and augmentation of exchange values. He is fanatically intent on the valorization of value. Consequently, he ruthlessly forces the human race to produce for production's sake. Only as personification of capital is the capitalist respectable. As such, he shares with the miser an absolute drive towards self-enrichment. But what appears in the miser as the mania of an individual is in the capitalist, the effect of his social mechanism in which he is merely a cog. The master's renunciation of jouissance lies in the difference between the miser and the capitalist, which entails several traps. The main one being that the miser can appear in comparison to the capitalist as a subject supposed to enjoy. The quoted passage contains the best description of the difference between enjoyment in the vulgar sense and what Lacan's concept of jouissance aims at. In everyday understanding, enjoyment is linked to consumption, which still presupposes positive qualities in concrete consumption, use value. The miser, by contrast, displays not some other or perverse enjoyment, but that which should be properly called jouissance. Instead of wasting his wealth on private consumption, he accumulates, jealously protecting his treasure from the rest of the world, first and foremost from his own temptation to waste it. In his abstinence, the miser does much more than simply renounce some immediate enjoyment in consumption. His drive for enrichment can reach satisfaction only in detaching the privileged embodiments of wealth, gold and money from their social circulation. His entire persona thereby becomes a hostage of the object. Two things are worth noticing in the difference between the miser and the capitalist, which also reveal why the capitalist is a figure of the master, while the miser is merely its comical caricature. Despite being a consequence of the social mechanism, the miser's drive is still actualized in the form of his subjective fixation and obsession, while in the capitalist the same drive is the structuring element of the social link. A systemic imperative that is interested solely in values and jouissance in the production process. The capitalist actualizes the truth of the miser and can become what the miser cannot. The personification of the systemic imperative of accumulation of wealth, now transformed into capital, that is, into an externalized social link that no longer includes merely accumulation, but also production, circulation, and individual consumption. The capitalist stands for globalization of the drive. Its sole function is to support and preserve the social implementation of the fanaticism of the demand to which the drive for enrichment is reducible. The constant expansion of value, the imperative of growth accompanied by the permanent revolution of the means of production and the forcing of populations into precarity. All this demands renunciation, indebting and production of lack which finally makes of the capitalist an inversion of the miser, the social transformation of the spirit of the miser. The miser, so to speak, renounced social relations for the sake of the illusion that the immediate access to jouissance is possible only in the form of treasure. For this reason, usury has been morally condemned throughout history and the miser fetishized as an obscene subject of jouissance. The miser illustrates Marx's remark that capitalism is already essentially abolished once we assume that it is enjoyment that is the driving motive and not enrichment itself. To rephrase, the miser does not entirely follow through on his attempt to detach the treasure from personal enjoyment. He detaches it from everyone, including himself, but he does not make the jouissance produced through this very detachment appear as the jouissance of the system. For the miser, jouissance assumes the finite and empirical form, while for the capitalist, treasure is the more endless, the more it is abstract. From gold to paper money, from paper money to fictitious capital, electronic money, and so on. The miser counts objects, his treasure is embodied. The capitalist mere, merely counts, his treasure is the number. Consequently, fetishization is displaced from concrete materiality to the ghostly materiality of financial abstractions. The more surplus is turned into an abstraction, the more it pertains to the system.
and the less the systemic obscenity is visible. The enrichment itself becomes a socially acceptable and admirable abstraction. But this enrichment contains its inevitable flip side, the production of surplus populations, the true signification of human capital, the equivocity between more and no more envisages this negative social production. Surplus value is the cause of desire which a certain economy has made its principle, that of the extensive and therefore insatiable production of a lack of jouissance, or another variation. I think I have sufficiently announced from the beginning of this year that surplus jouissance is something other than jouissance. Surplus jouissance responds not to jouissance, but to the loss of jouissance. The epistemological tool that provides an insight into the structure of the libidinal and the social economy is the second law of thermodynamics, which explains the flow of energy from regions with higher temperature to regions with lower temperature thereby introducing the notion of entropy. The notion already supported Marx's analysis of the extraction of surplus value from the consumption of labor power. The same asymmetry is reflected in the broader social context, the accumulation of wealth accompanied by the accumulation of misery, the revolution of the means of production combined with the production of a surplus population. The capitalist social link is structured like entropy. Lacan approaches energetics through the autonomy of the signifier and envisages in, in entropy a real structure which provides privileged insight into social contradictions. In this epistemological reading, energy is desubstantialized de and ontologically problematized. Energy is not a substance which, for example, improves or goes sour with age. It's a numerical constant that a physicist has to find in his calculations so as to be able to work. Without this constant, which is merely a combination of calculations, you have no more physics. The condition that the system be mathematically closed prevails even over the assumption that it is physically isolated. Lacan, in fact, criticizes Freud's energetic theory of the unconscious, which, under the pretension to provide positive scientific foundations, for psychoanalytic concepts ended up in a substantialist reading both of the objects of natural sciences and of his own inquiries. In Freud's mature work, the unconscious and the drive indeed obtained a problematic status, beginning to designate positive ontological entities that Freud no longer strived to explain through discursive causality, but rather through the speculative phylogenetic development stretching from protozoa to the human libido. When Lacan took Freud's early insight on the linguistic nature of the unconscious seriously, he directed psychoanalysis away from positivism and bio biologism. In the above quote, Lacan extends the same critical move to the natural sciences, claiming that their discoveries do not simply relate to an unproblematic empirical reality, but instead question the solidity and univocity of its ontological foundations. Such an interrogation is possible only under the condition that the relation between discourse and the real is no longer subsumed under the ideal of adequatio, in which discourse, as Lacan occasionally remarks, is considered to have no consequences whatsoever. The Lacanian distinction between reality and the real, moreover, results from this extension of the structural reading of psychoanalysis to the entire scientific modernity. In short, the difference between the two orders consists in the fact that reality designates merely the way the real appears to the human observer, reality as a grimace of the real. While the real, to put it paradoxically, stands for the way the real appears to the autonomy of the discourse, e.g. to mathematical language. When the signifier is introduced as an apparatus of jouissance, we should thus not be surprised to see something related to entropy appear. Since entropy is defined precisely once, one has started to lay this apparatus of signifiers over the physical world. We can hear the echo of Alexander Coiré's thesis that modern science no longer explains the empirical world in opposition to the Aristotelian and medieval science, which uses mathematics in order to save the appearances. Of course, the real cannot be the same in physics, psychoanalysis, or critique of political economy.
which deal with different orders of reality, physical, subjective, social, but also with different versions of discursive autonomy, formal language, the signifier, value. What does unite them, however, is the logical procedure according to which all these discourses encounter and formalize the respective structure of the real, in which objects like energy, jouissance, and surplus value can be theorized. Another way to situate the difference between reality and the real would be that in reality, the process of montage or construction is at stake, while the real demands decomposition and dissolution of appearances. In scientific discourse, in scientific discourse, the real is what remains for formalization to grasp once this decomposition has reached its bottom line. Or, as Lacan puts it, the real is what makes a whole in this articulated semblant that is the scientific discourse. Scientific discourse progresses without being preoccupied with the question of whether it is a semblant or not. What is important is what it is or what it what is important is that its network its web its lattice as we say makes the right holes appear in the right place its sole reference is the impossible to which its deductions amount this impossible is the real we can reach something real in physics precisely through the discursive apparatus as far as it as far as it in its rigor encounters the limits of its consistency in this respect, natural sciences contain a much more dialectical, speculative, and anti-empiricist kernel than the positivist epistemologies are willing to acknowledge. The encounter of the real takes place when the discourse faces its own inconsistency and not some absolute and substantial empirical outside. The actual site of the encounter is not in experimentation, but in formalization and in the deadlocks that accompany the scientific discourse on the path that leads to the resolution, abolition, or reduction of an epistemological deadlock. Verification of a hypothesis is already a step towards normalization, a moment of stabilization and reconstruction of reality. As Lacan often repeats, reality is what functions, and the functioning is what the master constantly demands, whereas the real is what does not function, something that violates or distorts the automatic repetition and flawless circulation of a discursive mechanism. This is one of the main lessons that can be drawn from Quarry's interpretation of modern scientific revolution. The scientific encounter of the real therefore rejects the all too simple distinction between extra linguistic and intra linguistic reality. It takes place within discourse but throws it out of joint. Pushing discursivity to its limits, where the real is inscribed into the symbolic, science exposes a dimension of language that is freed of its communicative, meaningful, and pragmatic function. In the same move, it rejects the substantialization of the real and the transcendentalism of the symbolic, showing that the real is neither an unattainable thing in itself, nor an unproblematic exteriority. And language is no prison without walls from which it is impossible to escape. Psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy are conditioned by this epistemological paradigm. The unconscious and class struggle, two real cracks in the social and the subjective reality, can be encountered by pushing the discursive consistency to its limits. Lacan's comments thus combine the epistemological and the political problematic that correlates the scientific discovery of labor power to the economic mathema mathematization of surplus value which abolished its pre-modern mystification. In the background, we can perceive an outline of another homology, this time between science and capitalism. It may appear that Lacan thereby came close to Heidegger's pessimistic vision in which science is reduced to its instrumental and technological essence. This reduction culminating in the controversial Heideggerian remark that science does not think bears the mark of fetishization. According to Heidegger, the, reali the realization of modern science and technology accomplishes the historical process of the oblivion of being th that determined Western metaphysics. With the globalization of abstract calculation, the paradigmatic case of non-thinking, which unites the scientific and the economic thoughtless
and therefore empty reason, the oblivion of being itself fell into oblivion. This is what Heidegger calls the danger. In this dark scenario, only poetic thinking can render the authentic, originary sense of being and overcome the domination of scientific calculus and capitalist abstractions. The negative fetishization of science is supplemented by the positive fetishization of poetry, which is for Heidegger the language of being. Yet Lacan never adopted Heidegger's antagonistic reading of mathematical language versus poetic language. What he did seem to endorse is the idea that modern science contains an ontological scandal that does not stand so much for the oblivion of the question of being, but instead reveals an unbridgeable gap between thinking and being, as well as between being and the real. Formalization is an exemplification of a concurrent sameness concerning thinking and the real, but the price for this sameness is the separation of thinking from being and consequently the decentralization or alienation of thinking. The radicalization of the structuralist project replaces the question of being with the examination of the ways in which the autonomy of the signifier enables thinking to encounter within being more than being, something that is neither being nor non-being, but non-realized. It is no coincidence that Heidegger never thematized the philosophical importance of Freud's discovery of the, of the unconscious. This paradigmatic example of a paradoxical entity that neither is nor is not, but insists in the state of repression as the persistence of the non-realized in thinking. It is also not surprising that Lacan found in mathematics the privileged correspondent in rethinking the ontological status of the unconscious and other real consequences linked to science, thereby making an anti-Heideggerian move par excellence. The epistemological and political orientation of the return to Freud thus displaces the accent from does science think to what form of thinking does modern science ground in? For Lacan, there is no dilemma. Science thinks and its thinking challenges the classical philosophical ideal of the thinking of thinking, as well as the foundation of ontology on the postulate of the sameness of thinking and being, as a language that fits the scientific discourse. Best mathematics is science without consciousness, the one that our good old Rabelais promised us, and in face of which a philosopher can only remain stupid. Gay science is thrilled when it observes in this the ruin of the soul, but of course neurosis survived it. The modern foundation of science and the autonomous signifier abolished the hypothesis of a centralized thinking that philosophy nevertheless renewed through the subject of cognition. A science without consciousness, without the subject of cognition as its central instance, mathematics detaches language from communication, the real from being, and thinking from itself. Marx and Freud repeat these moves in their analyses of the commodity form and unconscious formations, two concrete examples of decentralized thought. The abolition of the soul was the necessary epistemological condition for Freud's etiology of neuroses, a theory of causality that departs from the signifier as the material cause of jouissance and a materialization of the gap between thinking and being. Yet the subversive potential of mathematical language encounters its limit precisely in the commodity form, which builds on the same discursive autonomy and through which the capitalist fetishization of economic abstractions reintroduces the hypothesis of the soul through the back door, the commodity soul and the spectrality of capital that vitalizes the modern universe. The global market becomes the general formal envelope of thinking, thereby necessarily channeling all the subversive potential of modern science into the permanent revolution of the means of production. At a later point, Lacan distinguished between thinking science and objectified science, which immediately addresses its ambiguity in the capitalist framework. The distinction does not necessarily suggest that we are dealing with a good revolutionary science, which unmasks the illusory character of traditional and modern worldviews. As Freud claimed, and the bad commodified science that supports the perpetuation and reproduction of capitalism, 
Rather, the distinction insists that the, that the decentralization of thinking, the revolutionary dimension of science without consciousness, is inseparable from the historic genesis of a specific form of this decentralization, the commodity form. But it does situate science as one of the central terrains of struggle against capitalism, together with the epistemological conditions of the commodity form and the fetishization tied to capitalist abstractions. Modern science provides the necessary conditions for the invention of critical and conflictual sciences, such as psychoanalysis and the critique of political economy. In his analysis of the capitalist transformation of labor, Marx already encountered an essential scientific operation that Lacan named Reduction de Matériel, material reduction, the condensation of labor into labor power, which stands at the origin of the, absolute, the absolutization of the market, is a productive abstraction that seemingly reduces different forms of concrete labor, but in fact amounts to a new materiality of the subject. Material reduction is at work in every placement of the network of signifiers over a given reality, be it physical, social, or subjective, but it also concerns the entire history of logic, in which the autonomy and the materiality of the signifier is progressively isolated. The material reduction means that logic begins at a precise date in history when someone who had an understanding of this substituted certain elements of language that function in their natural syntax with a simple letter. And this is what inaugurates logic. Introducing A and B instead of saying, if this then, if this then that, does not seem to have any dramatic consequences. However, Aristotelian logic is merely the first step towards the autonomy of the signifier, the subordination of the signifier to the letter, which is still consistent with Aristotle's organonic notion of language. The actual subversion takes place in modernity when the new foundation of science brings about a different result. The, mathemat the mathematization of the signifier uncovering the distinction between reality and the real. A concrete case of this development is again offered by the historical transformation of the market, which, besides the condensation of labor, consisted in the quantification of surplus object. Something changed in the master's discourse at a certain point in history. We are not going to break our backs, finding out if it was because of Luther or Calvin or some unknown traffic of ships around Genoa, or in the Mediterranean Sea, or anywhere else. For the important point is that on a certain day, surplus jouissance became cal calculable, could be counted, totalized. This is where what is called the accumulation of capital begins. The extension of mathematization to economic reality, the capture of surplus value, and the isolation of labor power initiated a groundbreaking change in the master's discourse. The discursive structure that comprises both the logic of the signifier and the relations of domination. What matters in approaching the origins of capitalism is that concrete transformations in trade centers like Genoa and Venice were already embedded in a broader movement of scientific revolution, which found its ultimate expression in the implementation of formalization in the sphere of social production. We could paraphrase Marx here. The merchants did not know what they were doing. Nevertheless, they were doing it. The revolution was initiated before any attempt in writing a capitalist manifesto was undertaken. The subjective and the social surplus that antiquity and Christianity treated as a deviation from a presupposed normative model of social relations was integrated into the constitution of social reality. Marx's capital provides the first rigorous thought of this epistem epistemopolitical revolution, which implies a strictly determined notion of structure. Structure is therefore the real. This is, in general, determined by its convergence towards the impossible. Precisely in this, the structure is real. Within the Saussurian paradigm, such a, con such a conception could not have been formulated, yet it is inevitable once structuralism is coupled to Marx's materialist dialectics. Lacan's Marx is a structuralist avant la lettre, someone who enabled structuralism to walk on its feet again, 
by departing from the problem of discursive production. With a reinforced materialist orientation, material reduction too becomes more than an operation of scientific formalization and of capitalist commodification. It becomes the privileged tool of critique for exposing the deadlocks and contradictions in the given regime of production. By grasping discourse at the root where it most effectively determines the constitution of the subject, the critique of political economy effectively demonstrates that mathematical logic is highly essential for your existence in the real, whether you know it or not. Evidently, it is essential for pointing out the terrain where politics needs to intervene in order to bring about the double transformation of the subject and of the social link. It is at this point that the Freudian notion of the unconscious most decisively continues the epistemo-political orientation of Marx's critique.